my new book is called KGB Operations Against the United States and Canada in Soviet Ukraine in 1953-1991. Um, original title was Seductive Adversary KGB Operations in Soviet Ukraine uh, after Stalin, but uh, uh, I plan to uh, write another book, a sequel to this book, uh, about uh, KGB and CIA operations again against uh, Ukraine diaspora in America. So it will be a completely different book based not just on KGB documents, but on CIA, FBI and uh, American documents about how uh, two different uh, countries and uh, different intelligence services treated um, Ukrainian community in America, Canada and the United States. The story for this project is um, related to my failure to get original KGB documents in 2007 in Kyiv. I began reading my book on Dnipropetrovsk. I used uh, already opened um, the Communist Party archive in Dnipro. Um, probably you know that uh, after the Soviet Union, all these uh, Communist Party archives became open in the Ukraine and in Russia before Putin stopped this. And um, I found a wonderful um, so-called uh, monthly KGB reports about the situation in the Dnipropetrovsk region, which helped me a lot to figure out a major operation of KGB against young people of the closed city, of the rocket city in Dnipropetrovsk. And uh, I realized that um, copies of these documents, which I found in Dnipro and in uh, party archive, should be in Kiev. And I wrote a letter to uh, uh, KGB, well, in those days it was SBU already, and they promised that it will help me. And uh, I went to Kyiv and spent uh, time, you know, waiting for their response, and they rejected my access to the KGB, uh, KGB documents. So now it's my revenge time. <laughs> when finally everything opened, I decided, no, I need to publish and show um, how interesting in this collection. So, but uh, in 2007, I tried to uh, have access to these documents and I, I failed. They did not allow me to do this. Um, I had the strange, vague, you know, letters uh, about uh, technical, um, but, you know, before Maidan revolution, uh, SBU was part of FSB service. It was, you know, KGB network <laughs> empire still existed after the collapse of Soviet Union. Uh, I don't know if um, Americans and Canadians understand this, but uh, KGB influence was very important and uh, still very strong everywhere in, in post-Soviet space, including Kyiv. And moreover, you know, when I, I um, began working with these archives, um, uh, in 2018, I realized that uh, even for KGB, it's uh, important to publish something about them because it showed that not everyone in KGB service was stupid or you know crazy. They had plenty of uh, intelligent people who tried to understand the situation, but who were afraid of Moscow pressure, Kremlin pressure, you know. I found it even patriotic, you know, KGB people in, in, in the Ukraine. So even for their understanding, uh, true understanding of their service, and they help a lot, uh, you know, to stupid party apparatchiks, personnel from Shcherbitsky office who could not understand uh, the situation of culture cold war with the United States. So. I, I, I appreciate, for example, their uh, service. They sometimes uh, try to collaborate with CIA, protecting Brezhnev and Nixon when Nixon, Nixon uh, came to Kyiv in 1972. They tried to understand each other. You know, it was a period of daytime. So it's, it's, it's very interesting material which uh, will help us to understand Cold War from very different uh, point of view. From point of view of secret service.
collaboration, fight, struggle, dialogue, but it was very different, very different from today's situation when, uh, you know, Kremlin took very different position, um, uh, trying to isolate Ukraine, trying to um, cut all the, his relations with the United States. And, you know, my study showed that uh, even during the peak of Cold War, Soviet and American intelligence try to understand each other, try to prevent such conflict like now Putin's, uh, you know, uh, amassing this uh, huge 175,000 troops uh, on Ukraine body, um, you know, provoking uh, this conflict. It's real war. It's, 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 it's impossible to imagine during the 70s. So uh, again, you, you, you can find plenty of this material um, in, uh, in SBU archive. So it's need time uh, to, to, to work, to dig. And um, I am grateful for help from uh, Andri uh, Kohut, director of uh, this archive, um, Tatiana Pana Panova and other people who helped me. Moreover, probably you don't know, but uh, I need to tell to everybody. These guys um, uh, from Kiev are so helpful, so friendly. Um, I did not expect because I worked in, in Moscow, I remember these, you know, gloomy faces. <laughs> All this these guys were very different and they tried to help. And moreover, uh, they uh, help especially to, to people from other countries. Well, I'm, I'm American Ukrainian, so I live in both countries, so it's, it's a different situation. But still, uh, they help us with digital copies of documents. They provide digital copies of everything from Fund 16, it's um, uh, KGB correspondence with uh, Communist Party uh, personnel. So uh, at the beginning, I want to express my gratitude uh, to these great people, these librarian and archivists uh, from SBO Archive who help us. And uh, also express my gratitude to people who helped me to orient and who proofread my texts before it started as a book. Uh, Olga Bertelsten, uh, uh, Sergei Plohi uh, from Harvard, uh, Hiraki Kromia from, from um, uh, Indiana University, um, Taras Kuzio, um, Denis Yanblad. So many, many of these people helped me with my text, reading this, criticizing, uh, so especially so he, Olha, Taras helped me a lot. Thanks a lot. Moscow and the entire Soviet KGB took two strategy for um, uh, treating uh, United States and Canada, which were uh, major enemy for. Um, Soviet KGB, especially for Soviet Ukraine KGB. Um, uh, one strategy is collecting of intelligence, traditional uh, strategy, collecting and analyzing intelligence uh, information. And second uh, uh, part of uh, the separation was so-called active measures, aktivne мероприятия, uh, operations, uh, uh, which uh, tried to discredit enemy, to provoke enemy, to compromise enemy. Uh, for example, um, uh, in the KGB struggle against uh, Ukraine diaspora, they tried to present all the diaspora, including people from academic centers, from Harvard, from Columbia University, from Alba University, um, uh, of Alberta and Edmonton as, uh, uh, you know, Ukrainian fascists, people who collaborated with Nazis. So uh, for this uh, operation, they used uh, American and Canadian left, like Peter Kravchuk or Petro Kravchuk and other communists, uh, KGB through different channels, including uh, Soviet embassy, provided them 
with uh, compromising material about uh, members of Ukrainian diaspora in Canada and the United States, uh, about, for example, Omelian Pritsak, director of uh, Center uh, of Ukrainian Studies, uh, Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute, uh, presenting all these people as collaborators uh, with uh, uh, Nazi uh, during Nazi occupation of Ukraine. They sent archival material and they organized special campaigns even in the press, in media, um, giving uh, documentary films um, and some books were published uh, using uh, Canadian communist and American communist support about um, this uh, Ukrainian Nazi collaboration during the war. Moreover, the Soviets uh, not only provide this document, they uh, engage other groups, like, uh, for example, um, groups of um, uh, American uh, Jewish community uh, presenting uh, Ukrainian diaspora as not only uh, Nazi collaborators, but also anti-Semites, you know, fascists. Um, and uh, they use this um, in different operations. For example, when uh, Taras Shevchenko a monument was opened in um, uh, downtown DC, you of course know this uh, uh, sculpture. Uh, they organized anti-Ukrainian um, demonstration there, uh, anti-American Ukrainian demonstrations using um, students from black colleges of DC area. Uh, I found, and I, I, I put this in, in, in my book, a fascinating document how uh, a KGB provoked uh, radicals, uh, radical students from Harvard University. It's, it's traditional um, black college, Afro-American college in DC area. Um, they engage these students, especially a group of Black Panthers movement, you know, Black Panthers Party. Um, they supported this group. Uh, and again, I had this anti-Ukraine demonstration, uh, you know, shouting these slogans. Uh, these guys are fascists. They, they are Nazi. They are anti-Semites. And um, uh, so this is just one example of how KGB uh, tried to organize this. Um, others. So uh, two major group, uh, strategies, traditional collecting of uh, intelligence information. And um, uh, second is these active measures, provocations, uh, discreditations, um, collecting compromise and compromising people. Well, uh, you know, it was not uh, just KGB. Unfortunately, uh, KGB used um, American Canadian left. Probably you know that in Canada, 50% of uh, Canadian communists are Ukrainians. More than, in, it was in the 60s and 70s uh, at least. So um, they used this group like uh, Peter Kravchuk for organizing these campaigns, starting with publication in the media, then television, uh, radio, and then providing documents for uh, prosecutor offices. So unfortunately they did this. and. Uh, um, their major goal was uh, to use um, this traditional um, old Roman tactics, you know, divida et impera, uh, divide and conquer, divide and control. Uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, everybody knows this, but uh, KGB were very successful. They had two enemies, uh, ideological enemies, uh, Ukrainian nationalism and Jewish nationalism. So their major goal was to split uh, them, to divide them and uh, prevent building connections between Jews and Ukrainians. Probably you know that in the 70s, uh, Ukrainian, American Ukrainians and uh, American Jews try to collaborate. They, you know, they criticize um, Soviet politics of suppression of dissidents of both Ukrainian patriots and Jewish patriots in Ukraine. 
and the KGB tried to compromise uh, these communities, both Ukrainians and uh, uh, um, and uh, Jews. So it's it's only part of uh, my research. It's the beginning of my research. But uh, another <laughs> very important issue, uh, you know, it's uh, issue of meddling in American and Canadian politics. For example, KGBs through uh, their network collect information about position of certain Canadian and American politicians, and they choose people who were friendly or sympathetic towards Soviet Union, who tried to establish good relations with Soviet Ukraine, and as a result, they organize different, and I describe this in detail in my book, um, various campaign of support of these politicians in uh, Canada and in um, uh, United States. And then they used different groups, not only uh, communists, but also those groups who uh, presented so-called pacifist movement, anti-war movement, um, Black Liberation Movement, Black Panthers were on payroll in many cases by KGB and uh, they supported uh, Black Panthers. Okay, I, I explained this case in Harvard University in um, DC area when they used the Black Panthers against Ukrainians uh, f uh, during the Strashevchenko uh, monument um, uh, opening and so on. And uh, they uh, used certain uh, American politicians, for example, Hubert Humphrey, uh, former vice president of the United States, who was a Democratic candidate, was supported by KGB, um, including by KGB Kyiv office, Ukraine office. They invited uh, Humphrey to Kyiv many times. Uh, they uh, invested money in his campaign, millions of dollars. And actually, it's it's famous fact, fact uh, the Brinian, uh, Soviet ambassador participated in this operation, but was interesting for me, it's how Ukrainian KGB took part in this. They invited all advisors of Humphrey to Kyiv. Uh, they organized special interviewing of them, provided them with, uh, uh, you know, with... Um, uh, good accommodations, with uh, <clears throat> uh, opportunity to visit uh, Crimean resorts. Uh, it's a kind of bribery. It's like, um, for example, in the case of uh, Trump, probably, you know, in the 80s, it be invited him to, to Soviet Union, helping uh, him. So it's a traditional uh, KGB politics preparing so-called useful assets for their, um, uh, their uh, politics. And uh, uh, Humphrey, uh, Vice President of the United States, was very important assets fighting um, Nixon. They hated Nixon in those days, uh, reaching Nixon. Later on, Nixon met Reagan, you know this, but in the 60s, uh, they hate Republicans, and because Republicans were very anti-Soviet. And um, example, of, um, Humphrey, it's, it's, it's very important. And they use academics also as well. Those academics who were more friendly, um, uh, were supported, those who criticized Soviet Union were uh, not uh, welcome to Soviet Ukraine. Uh, in my chapter about Peter Kravchuk and uh, these American uh, Canadian left who were supported by yeah, Petro Kravchuk from from Troy, you probably know this name, and, and I, I I I knew his uh, his daughter Larissa. I uh, met Larissa. I collected some documents from Larissa about um, uh, Kravchuk uh, correspondence. You know, Kravchuk at the beginning was a useful tool for KGB, and uh, uh, of course, members of uh, Ukrainian Canadian community hated his support of Soviet Union. They organized special campaigns against Kravchuk, against all these left uh, uh, leftist groups, 
because these guys had material support uh, and business support from um, the Soviet Union. I uh, wrote uh, using uh, KGB documents and uh, Canadian uh, materials, uh, John Kalaski's uh, material as well, who was former uh, communist, uh, Canadian communist, who was dis disappointed and frustrated with what he uh, saw in uh, in Soviet Ukraine in '65, when he realized that this was um, uh, Russification of Ukraine. It was not good for Ukraine. And he began criticizing Fedor Kravchuk. So I'm describing how different groups of Canadian Ukrainians actually organized a campaign against Kravchuk. How Kravchuk failed, and eventually Kravchuk discovered all these cases of Russification, and he became target of KGB because they were afraid that he will be anti-Soviet, well, he was, you know, communist, but, but Ukrainian communist who saw all these mistakes, all these justifications, all this pressure from above. And I uh, described this evolution of KGB attitude toward uh, Kravchuk. Kravchuk became the enemy by the end. So in after 69, when he first openly criticized KGB interference in Canadian affairs, in uh, you know, in uh, dissident movement and suppression of dissident movement in Soviet Ukraine, he became anti-Soviet because of of the truth, of the reality of the events. So, uh, and uh, it's one of uh, my favorite uh, chapters, chapter three, about Kravchuk and about how uh, representatives of KGB uh, through uh, Americanists engaged in KGB activists like Shlipakov try to influence uh, influence um, uh, Kravchuk. Unfortunately, uh, nobody paid attention to very important tool of influence on Canadian and American uh, communists. It's business affairs. You, you can't live in American Canada without business, without, you know, organizing some kind of enterprise and so on. Uh, printing, uh, a tourist business, and um, all these businesses organized by Kravchuk and his comrades in Canada and America were supported by Soviets. So they became very lucrative deals for these communists. So uh, this another very important issue which prevented Kravchuk and other his comrades openly criticize Soviet Union and distance themselves from Soviet Union because they need money, all these deals were there. So this is unfortunately tradition I describe in my book, which still affect American businesses, uh, not left, uh, but um, other businesses which related to post-Soviet uh, capitalists of, from Putin's uh, group from other people who still affect both Canadian and American politicians in different way. But it's a different story. It's not a uh, uh, subject of my book. I just uh, discovered uh, the roots of these businesses, which still... Of course, uh, many of these documents are still classified despite the opening of uh, KF archives, but some um, evidence still exists about infiltration of KGB elements in all spheres of politics, academy, uh, technology, um, and uh, uh, this is a traditional uh, strategy of KGB. It's creating of so-called sleeping cells in Canada and Ukraine. When uh, um, uh, they infiltrate, uh, for example, university uh, group, uh, uh, faculty, um, personnel of, um, especially uh, of media uh, channels, uh, television and radio, with their own representative, who uh, on surface look like loyal, 
Canadian and American citizens, but they related to KGB, they KGB agent. And I was shocked according to their numbers. I, I uh, found these numbers. You'll be shocked, especially in Canada, in um, uh, United States. Uh, every year during the 70s, at least 270 agents were infiltrated every year. It's terrible figure. Can you imagine 250, 270 every year uh, under different pretexts? They used um, compromised Canadian citizens. Uh, for example, you stole something, you uh, mishandled some situation. Uh, these guys, and I, I describe in my book, certain operations, how they try to help uh, these people uh, be friendly. And then when they organized this help, they had a leverage. You became an asset of these guys. So again, um, this is a typical example of how it affects. Um, uh, I describe how in academia, for example, they invited people um, uh, to special accommodation, Kiev and uh, Lviv, uh, they provided with help assistance. If you do not collaborate, they finish um, uh, help. Uh, I discovered actually interesting material and I published how uh, they uh, organized campaign against even leftist uh, Canadian academics in America, like John Paul Himka. Um, uh, who uh, did not want to collaborate with KGB in those days, and uh, they organized actually uh, brutal campaigns against him uh, and other Canadian and um, American scholars who visited in the 70s uh, Kiev State University and tried to you know collect material. And paradox was that John Paul Himka collected material about Marxist groups in Galicia, it's about social democrats, but still for them it was attempt to divide Ukraine, you know, to use material against Soviet Ukraine. But if you collaborate, and uh, this became obvious, especially in the 80s and 90s, uh, they uh, started uh, supporting these groups. Many people, businessmen, um, uh, faculty members, uh, members of media became uh, involved and influenced. Mm, and in the 80s, and I finish uh, my book with this, in the 80s, uh, many of these people uh, from Soviet Union went on exchange programs. And, uh, you know, uh, you remember from my, my so the, uh, Americana, I mentioned that uh, majority of people who went for exchange programs were uh, KGB spies. Um, uh, my ratio was uh, three from four, usually were KGB or GRU GRU, uh, agents who collected technological, political, uh, diplomatic uh, information, who participated in various uh, active measures. So it's it's traditional politics of infiltration. And these guys eventually settled down, many of them settled down in Canada and Ukraine. Um, uh, many of them uh, became political scientists. They uh, were accepted by Canadian and uh, um, American institutions. If you analyze their background, all these guys, I will not give you the names. They everywhere uh, in in uh, Canadian and uh, American faculty. Uh, uh, they came from elites, and many of them came. Uh, for example, one political scientist I know from uh, San Francisco area, who, who's a member of uh, KGB families. So paradox is that both um, uh, Americans and Canadians forgot about that, that Cold War. And they accepted these guys, and these guys actually took very pro-Russian, pro-Putin position. Why? Because many of them are members of KGB families. Their parents were KGB officers. And you know, you, you don't need to ask me, just go to Google and uh, check uh, CV of these people. They infiltrated our academia, unfortunately. Uh, three areas, business, media, and uh, cultural education. 
And uh, you need to understand that KGB from the early beginning was business institution, making money. I describe how they use, for example, people of Jewish descent who went to Israel and the United States in immigration for collecting money. They will not allow you to go to the United States as refugee, Jewish refugee, without paying, without agreeing to collaborate with uh, KGB. Uh, I present in my book seven. It, it's all. It's you can find this in the now open archives. It's not a secret anymore. Uh, for example, uh, they collected money from those Jewish families uh, who lived in Canada and you and the United States, especially the United States, who died, and you need to manage their um, inheritance. You know, inheritance their money. So they try to find their relatives. They found these relatives in Kiev, Dnipro, Lviv, or in somewhere in Ukraine. What KGB did? They contacted this family in Ukraine, recruited members of this family as their active agents, and they found plenty of files of these guys, Jewish guys, for collecting money from their relatives. Because you, you are not supposed to have American dollars or Canadian dollars in Soviet Ukraine. So this money came to coffers of KGB. And of course, they shared uh, their money with these Jewish guys, with these members of the family. Um, but majority of these funds from the United States Canada came to KGB. KGB organized successful businesses um, um, blackmailing American and Canadian uh, businessmen who, for example, were compromised having Russian or Ukrainian hookah in Kiev. Uh, these guys collected compromise, uh, compromising materials, so called compromat, and used them as asset. So I described five or six cases of this. Uh, I described how they failed uh, compromising um, gays in uh, American uh, uh, exposition in the Kiev uh, because Americans didn't care about you know gay relations because uh, you know America was more democratic about this. But um, uh, overall, KGB operations were successful in compromising uh, important people, so-called assets. You need to understand that these guys who uh, submitted all these documents were human beings. They live in a certain situation. But many of them were very intelligent people. And um, uh, you need to understand they need, first of all, to survive, make career, make money. On the one hand, on the other hand, they also wanted to enjoy life. They love America, they love Canada, they, they love this Western uh, way of life. And sometimes they understand stupidity of these requirements from Kremlin or from Sherbitsky office. And they try to accommodate this. That's why many people like Taras Shevchenko, Taras Kuzio, and, uh, could not understand uh, the, the, you know, uh, the culture behind these documents. So I try to, to uh, analyze these documents more and uh, figure out what is true, what is not, what is more efficient, what is just part of this ideological stupid campaign, like documents about punks or hippies and so on. But still, even in these documents, you can find very interesting documents, crisis of Soviet identity among Soviet young people, especially college educated people. And uh, they hired special sociologists and uh, submitted very much. So you're right. Sometimes uh, these documents are from our situation today, from our mentality point today, look a very stupid, very ignorant. But not very many at first. Second, many of these documents were for consumption of personnel of Communist Party, Sherbitsky office or shellist office. So they need to accommodate, you know, intellectual <laughs> level, which to some extent 
sorry for this language, was not very good for uh, these politicians, Rosh Hashanah or Shilbinsky office. And these guys understood this because many of them lived in the West. They knew languages. Even being brainwashed by propaganda, and so, they still live there. They look at the, you know, it's it's different kind of mind. And they became very successful businessmen. Another topic of my, my uh, book, very successful business. And now they used tremendous wealth of Soviet Union to bribe Western politicians. In Germany, look what is going on in Germany. In America, look at both sides, both Democrats and uh, Republicans are bribed by these guys who are on this, uh, you know, capitalist KGB or FSB now payroll. But these traditions came before. I argue that in the 50s and 60s, these guys tried to bribe Trudeau administration in Kiev, Humphrey administration in DC as early as the 60s, using money, using money as a leverage. So nothing new in what uh, Putin is doing today. Putin used more money, of course, than in those days to bribe. Yeah. yeah, I will not open the series. You need to read the book. <laughs> but um, I have a chapter about how KGB tried to figure out which politician, including Trudeau administration, took pro-Soviet position. Uh, many of them with Ukrainian names. I will not give you, you need to read the book. Uh, I stopped talking about Kavchuk because it's which I, I uh, open for my um, future readers. And uh, they uh, try to organize this supportive campaign for these politicians. They invite them to Kyiv. They uh, interview them in Kyiv. They gave them publicity. Um, they even supported publication in New York Times, in uh, uh, Toronto Press and other uh, Canadian uh, American uh, publications. They helped to publish um, positive material in American Canadian press supporting these politicians. So it was very um, organized and a very intelligent uh, campaign, and they succeeded. Uh, well, they did not succeed with the uh, Humphrey uh, campaign. Humphrey lost eventually, and Nixon won, but they supported Nixon eventually. You know, I, I surprised how KGB used Jewish money. I never, uh, well, I, I could assume, but I never expected this business operation, you know, to, uh, to use uh, these Jewish guys who flew from regime to the United States as assets for future intelligence work. You know, I met a lot of Jew, Soviet Jews here in the United States, and I asked them, everybody, of course, rejected this. But this is in documents with names, you know, with... Uh, uh, dates, especially in the 70s, it was, you know, it was massive. Um, this uh, um, uh, uh, fact uh, was surprising. Another very uh, interesting uh, fact which I discovered how um, KGB in 50s and 60s used nostalgic and patriotic feelings of both Ukrainians and Americans, immigrants. Uh, immigrants of this category called DP, you know, displaced peasants. And uh, they infiltrated all major CIA schools like Astra Center in, at Regensburg in Bavaria. I have an entire chapter at the beginning how they used Ukrainians and Russians. Ukrainians who represent Oun, Upa, Banderovites, and the Russians who represent in their imagination Roa, you know, Vlasov um, uh, army, uh, Russian liberated army, which comrade with, uh, with uh, Nazi. 
and they used uh, various. Um, uh, I, I love this entire entire chapter. It's about double agents um, uh, who came from these uh, spy schools in Germany, uh, and I, I found a lot of stories how Soviets used uh, personal feelings of both Russians and Ukrainians, including the, the anti-Semitism, because many of the instructors were American Jews. Um, and they, you know, use uh, these uh, nationalistic, um, patriotic probably feelings to engage these people, to provoke them, to compromise them, and to re recruit them. So these guys became double agents. So according to my uh, statistics, all major CIA operations against Soviet Ukraine, which were rooted in all these schools, failed because of successful strategy of KGB. KGB and, and GRU, uh, actually uh, destroyed all major operations of Astra and other CIA centers in Germany um, after 53. All of them failed. Images of um, uh, Agent Natasha, who was a member of Onupa family, Vanderavite, and uh, she eventually went to Odessa uh, Foreign Language Institute and she became an agent, double agent, Natasha, very sexy lady. And she was used by KGB against Canadian and American Ukrainians. And she was very successful. All these American and Ukrainian Canadian tourists and students and faculty members were compromised and uh, under KGB control. For example, Natasha, it's, it's a very important story in my, my book. And this is uh, uh, Satyanova, another double agent who tried to um, uh, to, pro to compromise um, Americans with the Soviet Union. She, she became a double agent. She worked for both CIA and KGB. And she committed suicide because she wanted to live in America. She hated, as I understood from KGB reports, the uh, reality of life in Soviet Ukraine. And she was caught and uh, she took a pill. Uh, during the uh, 70s, uh, according to my uh, research, 95% of Kyiv administration, Kyiv administration, were mostly Russians and Ukrainians. Yes, in the 50s and 40s, it was a different ratio, but not in the 70s. Sometimes we exaggerate this role of uh, Jewish, uh, you know, Ukrainian elements in the KGB, but in the 70s it was not. You can check, it's, it's, they have special data for, in uh, Fund 16, it's, it's not a secret, but you need to dig. But in the 70s, no, it's, it's incorrect. You know, but I forgot uh, another thing. What is interesting for me, uh, you asked me what is was new for me. It's how important was this narrative of fascist Ukrainian, especially in youth culture. Even some hippies who um, uh, students of uh, Kiev State University and leave uh, State University uh, because of their uh, preference were considered to be fascist. So this trope, this uh, idea and this connection of fascism and Ukraine became so important for KGB operations starting with CIA uh, confrontation in 50, 40s and 50s, these CIA school and finishing with youth culture. And um, uh, especially uh, during this uh, punk rock movement in Ukraine, when uh, Soviet youth um, uh, discovered interesting um, Italian film. It's actually a fascist film. It's called San Babila 20 Hours. It's about a neo-fascist group in uh, Milano, in uh, 
Italy. And it was uh, bought by Soviets and showed everywhere. It's anti-fascist uh, film, but because of presenting these guys, you know, in very fashionable um, uh, leather jacket jeans, you know, who looked uh, very sleek, and it's uh, it's became a fashion uh, <laughs> by the Ukrainian students, and many of them began blaming the Soviet leadership for mafia state for fascist state and KGB could not understand this and uh, you know to present uh, the information to um, Soviet leadership political leadership uh, Sherbitsky for example office they try to uh, analyze this movement and they uh, blame uh, Russia uh, Ukrainian young people in fascism they became neo-nazi and thousands of people were arrested. I, I uh, covered slightly this topic in my uh, Deeper Drops book, but now I found tons of document, documents. And through entire KGB history in Kyiv, they use this trope, Ukrainian fascists all the time. That's why now Putin, for example, justify his war on coming war with Ukraine um, on the same level, you know, ideological level, presenting Ukrainians as fascists. And again, this um, trope, uh, this uh, discursive strategy was started not by Communist Party, it was started by Ukrainian KGB to present and analyze all these movements. And they were wrong. They were mistaken but unfortunately this as i realized reflect this moscow uh perception of ukrainian nationalism even uh jewish nationalism was presented as you know jewish fascism look what they uh, uh, did to arabs in palestine so this fascist trope this fascist discursive model became uh, invented by kgb during this period of time, and still used by uh, Russian media for justification of future Russian aggression against Ukraine. This is a dangerous uh, moment, and started as early as 50s and 60s in KGB operations. First, nothing is new in history. Because Divida et Impera existed from, you know, from ancient times. Um, ideological campaigns uh, existed since French Revolution. Uh, policies of compromise, compromise, compromise in, uh, existed from um, French Revolution times. Um, and uh, it was special implemented during uh, Nazi regime and Abelson ideological operations. Um, my, my first lesson is nothing new. Uh, the second lesson is how influential was KGB in Soviet society. Almost every one person of Soviet society, in my case it's Soviet Ukrainian society, denounced another person. Uh, wrote reports. Those guys who did not write or did not complain were compromised. So uh, the second lesson is um, important influence of KGB in everyday aspect of Soviet life. I could not expect this. You know, I I, um, I had in my uh, practice few uh, encounters Founders with KGB officers who control Nipotrovsk University because I uh, play dangerous music for my dialogue club, uh, you know, music, uh, punks and so on, and try to explain that, that those punks were not fascist, they were pro-communist. Clash was never fascist, bad, <laughs> uh, you know, Clash uh, rock band from England, and <laughs> I try to explain these guys. So I, I had these experiences, but I never anticipated this massive surveillance campaign um, 
in uh, KGB practices. Uh, many people uh, uh, from my uh, group, uh, faculty members at Nipros University, uh, were connected to them. I found their reports, uh, how they denounced, for example, Yuri Metzik, my colleague, uh, my teacher from the university. Uh, um, a, and for me, it was, you know, it was a shame. I, I realized it's, it was everywhere. So second influence was uh, this, uh, second lesson was this massive, total influence of KGB on our life. Uh, they knew everything. Uh, and um, uh, part of this lesson is uh, that KGB was not so stupid as I, as I thought. They were very intelligent. They made money as early as 50s. They organized their corporations, you know, cover corporations in America, in Canada. Well, Global Travel uh, Corporation from uh, uh, Toronto, it exists under a different name. It was created by KGB. I opened you my secret. So, so it's, it's not far. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and that's the, but, uh, so the second question is uh, their influence everywhere, including, uh, you know, diplomacy of the um, Soviet Union. Um, number three, uh, discovery. And number three, lesson is that this influence, KGB influence, especially business influence, uh, this massive American and European corruption still exists. It's not just American and Western corruption. It's how Soviet space brought this corruption through Ukrainian and American oligarchs like Deripaska, um, Firtash. Majority of them came from Ukraine, by the way being either Ukrainian Jews or, you know, just Ukrainians, Soviet Ukraine, but they, they related 100% to FSB. And uh, capitalist, major capitalist Putin, KGB capitalists, used them for bribing Democrats, Republicans, um, uh, and Canadian politicians, because you can imagine how much money now they have. I realized another uh, discovery for me was how rich was Soviet Union. Can you imagine all these billions of dollars now used for bribing, for building this positive image of Russia? Not Ukraine, rather Ukraine is corrupt. And the last, the last lesson is uh, Collaboration between uh, CIA and KGB, and it was important to stop the war, to stop. Something. Unfortunately, this tradition is not uh, active now. Look at what happened in the Kremlin. CIA director came to Kremlin explaining, stop. Nothing happened. So my lesson is, and I want this book will show this lesson to everybody. All these intelligence services should collaborate, should understand each other. What was each other like during the 72 Nixon visit to Kiev? Or um, in 1960, Dwight Eisenhower was ready to visit uh, Kiev, but because of YouTube scandal, you remember you too plane was shut down it was uh, uh stopped but i found plenty of material how both cia and kgb offices tried to understand each other and stop stupidity of these generals admirals and politicians like Brezhnev, nixon um and others so it's a very important lesson. We need to understand. We need to collaborate, not to fight. And unfortunately, we have uh, one leader, Putin, who actually had never reached a position of general 
in KGB. He was just middle range operatives. And unfortunately, he lost this grip with reality. Uh, tragedy of Russia and the entire post-Soviet space that we have greedy KGB operatives taking power who wanted only one thing, money, good living. They didn't care about us, about people. And uh, my major lesson from this book that these old personnel of CIA and KGB were much more intelligent and important for keeping peace uh, on the earth than these post KGB uh, officers who became presidents and uh, leaders of post-Soviet space. Yes, all of them. And uh, this continued even in 1995-96 uh, 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 years. So all Canadian, all American students who arrived to Soviet or post-Soviet Ukraine in the 90s had um, this official surveillance from KGB or SBU or later on. This is official rule. It was introduced earlier, but with opening Soviet Ukraine under Khrushchev, uh, it became a uh, tradition. And all major documents, you know, I, I was tired to use all these cases. It was John Himka case, it was a uh, case of uh, Mark von Hagen. Uh, I, I put this in my book, uh, uh, Grimstead Kennedy, um, many of them. Uh, Sisin was not uh, uh, allowed because of his nationalism and um, uh, religious uh, topics of his research. Um, so all these people were monitored. And it didn't matter if Himka was left or um, uh, Kennedy Greenstein was moderate. All um, Canadian and uh, American students were considered to be agents of the CIA. I put the entire case of Indiana University students because I'm from Indiana. And it was from, from our position is a stupid case. They analyzed all lecture courses in Bloomington and found all of them anti-Soviet and instruction for action. Even a uh, special questionnaire was uh, prepared for these students, which was analyzed by KGB as pro-CIA. And later on, these guys, who I, I interviewed three, of old uh, KGB officers who uh, agreed to uh, to do this interview and who uh, introduced were introduced by Leshenka, another friend of mine, uh, you know this Americanist who died in uh, 2013, and they told me, Sergei, we did not believe this, but major requirement from Kremlin was to present all these guys uh, as spies, potential spies. All these young students, you know, 18, 19 uh, years old student from Bloomington <laughs> as a CIA agent, it's, it's, it's a nonsense. But they explained it, that uh, KGB had special bonus payments. So the more reports, the more proof you will give about these successful operations, the better bonus, the better money. So it's, it's, it's a complete business. So, and I describe this business regarding this uh, Indian, uh, Indian investor students as an attempt to, to, to attract attention, to get more money for their salary as a success story for KGB. So for you, it sounds weird, but I, I understand their mentality. They need money. <laughs> uh, the last lesson, um, you need to understand uh, this influence of KGB business today. Many successful, uh, successful businesses in Ukraine, in Russia, and overseas 
were either allowed or sponsored or had connection to the service. And um, nothing strange uh, is uh, in, in this. Uh, KGB were the first who were exposed to Western influences. They organized uh, various businesses, uh, travel agencies, um, publishing houses, um, and um, financial institutions in the West as early as the 70s, using Americans and Canadians as cover for the operation. And these organizations still exist. Just go to Google and look at the Globe Travel uh, Organization, and that's it. Thank you for your attention to my project.